In this video, we're gonna show you how to do a laboratory developed test, an LDT on the COVID flu and RSV qPCR assay. You can use this as a template for any molecular assay. The first thing you have to do is you have to make a validation plan. The validation plan needs to be signed off by your medical director before you begin. A great place to store your validation plan is Media Lab. That's great for document tracking. So when you're doing a validation plan, what you wanna include is sensitivity studies, basically your LODs, how low can you go? The second one you wanna do is specificity, which is making sure you're hitting the right targets. You also want to do an accuracy study. Is positive positive? Is negative negative? And the last thing you want to do is a precision study. That's your replicates, right? Whether it's 20 replicates or 30 replicates, you want to make sure that the kit is extremely robust. Since this is a qualitative assay, you're not really going to have a reportable range. It's either positive or negative for this molecular assay, but it's always good to mention something about a reportable range. And for the vast majority of LDTs that are quantitative, you will have a specified reportable range. Materials and methods. Before you begin, what you wanna have is your validation plan. You wanna have all the plastics that you're gonna use. You wanna have your kit that you're gonna use. You also wanna make sure you have all the standards and reagents and interfering substances. And then you definitely also wanna have your clinical samples as well. One of the most important parts of the validation is the sensitivity study. That's where you're determining your LOD otherwise known as the limit of detection. We get our standards from ATCC because they're enumerated. Enumerated means you know the concentration of the standards. And then we wanna start from a high concentration, like 10 to the fourth, and we wanna do a one to 10 dilution all the way down. So 10 to the fourth, 10 to the third, 10 to the second, and so on. And in order to determine where your LOD is, you do three out of three replicates at each concentration level. And then when you get to the LOD, which is the point at which you're not getting three out of three amplifications beyond that point, then you wanna go ahead and see if you can get 20 out of 20 replicates of that LOD. It might be good practice to not go to the lowest LOD, but maybe one just above that because that's gonna be the most reproducible and reliable. Finally, confirming your LOD. So you wanted to do the three out of three replicates for all the LOD dilutions, like 10 to the fourth, 10 to the third, and so on. And for your final LOD, you need to do 20 replicates of that one. And you need to achieve at least 95% accuracy for a pass, which means 19 out of 20. Here are the five most common mistakes that I see people make during the LOD that leads to poor sensitivities or at worst, a failed validation. Mistake number one, not keeping everything cold. Your master mix needs to be cold. Your sample needs to be on a cold block. Reagents need to be in the fridge or freezer and you wanna use them as quickly as possible. If the temperature increases, your reaction's running away, you're wasting primer, you're wasting probe, you're wasting enzyme, and that's gonna lead to a lot poor sensitivities. Mistake number two is not using the right plastics. You wanna use low DNA binding pipette tips and microcentrifuge tubes and plastics. That way you're not losing any of your sample to the plastics, which again is gonna lead to poor sensitivities. The third thing that I notice is people diluting with water. Sure, water is an obvious thing to dilute with, but if you use TE, buffer, RNA is much more stable in T buffer, you're gonna get much better sensitivities. Mistake number four is going for the lowest LOD possible. If you went with the LOD just above that, you're gonna get excellent precision results and sensitivity results. If you go to the lowest one, you're gonna probably brick the precision and sensitivity portions. And the last thing, doing the standards one at a time, if you mix them all in the vial, you can do your validation a lot faster. You will lose a little bit of sensitivity, but I think most of the time it's worth it for the speed. This next section is precision. Precision is determining how tight your values are. So how reproducible your values are. What we do for the first part is we wanna determine the intraday precision studies. You can grab the data you got from the LOD studies, the 20 out of 20 replicates there, and you wanna determine if the CV is within 10%. If it is, that's a pass. The next section, we're determining the between day precision studies. And what we wanna do is we wanna take three replicates of the high, three replicates of the low, and three blanks. So that would be 20X LOD, 
a 5X LOD and a blank, and we wanna do three samples of each. And then if those samples are within the CV of 10%, those would pass as well. Now, a key point to keep in mind is how you lay out your samples. Here's an example of what a plate would look like. So if you'll notice, we have the high and the low samples interspersed and we have blanks in between. The reason why we wanna have blanks in between the rows of wells is because we wanna see if there's contamination or carryover between the wells. The next section is specificity. Are you hitting the right targets? There's two parts to specificity. There's the interfering substance study and the cross-reactivity study. The interfering substance study is to determine if exogenous and endogenous substances affect your result. An example of an ex... An example of an exogenous, an example of an exogenous, say that three times fast. An example of an exogenous control, nasal spray, or something that you would have on your nose prior to taking the sample. An endogenous interfering substance would be blood. So we use a 2% blood typically for that. So the reason why you're doing these two studies is to determine if you're getting suppression of amplification by these exogenous and endogenous interferences. And the way that you would do that is just to run two to three replicates of these to see if you're still getting full amplification of these runs. Next, we're looking for cross-reactivity. What that means is, are we able to hit the right targets? And we're not gonna count targets that shouldn't be counted. So in this validation, we're doing COVID flu RSV. We can buy other targets from companies like Zeptometrics for similar viruses like adenovirus or rhinovirus. And these viruses should not amplify. So we could spike the samples, blank samples with these, and run the sample, and you should see no amplification. If you do, your kit's not that specific, shouldn't be used. And your kit sucks. Next section, accuracy. Are you getting the right result? Is positive positive? Is negative negative? So in order to do this study, you wanna have 20 clinical samples, ideally 10 positive samples and 10 negative samples. And what you wanna see are all the positives being co completely correct and all the negatives being completely correct. You need at minimum a 90% positive and negative correlation for pass, but obviously a perfect score would be ideal. Next section is reference range and reportable range. For the reference range, that is what are the values that a normal healthy population should have. In this section, it's just gonna be not detected. And then for reportable range, since it's a qualitative assay, it's just gonna be detected, not detected, that's it. And keep in mind, this is for each pathogen. No <laughs> All right, great job, you finished. Now it's time to write that validation report. Not only do you have to have all the data in the validation report, but you wanna have all the materials and methods listed that you use. Serial numbers of instruments, lot numbers of reagents, what day were things run. All the information for all the items that you were using needs to go into that report. And then when it's all done and compiled, you want to get your lab director to sign off on it. From there, you're gonna need an SOP, which is standard operating procedure, step-by-step -step instructions teaching everybody how to use this kit. And then finally, you need to have your training. So all the people that are gonna be running this kit needs to be trained and competent, and that needs to be signed off as well. So you're done with the validation. Congratulations, great job, you did it. Now I leave you with three final things to consider. Um, one, this validation is entirely dependent on your lab director's approval. So it may be more stringent or less stringent than what we have mentioned in this video. We've leaned toward the more stringent side so that it satisfies the vast majority of lab director's criteria. Second thing to keep in mind are the CT range cutoffs. You will need to determine whether a sample is considered positive or negative based on a CT value cutoff that's typically determined by what your results and what's valid and invalid. And finally, you wanna keep in mind that there's generally system parameters or reporting parameters within the software that you can set up to help you with automated reporting. So there's usually some kind of file settings that can compile all of this pass or fail criteria within the software to give you ready results after you finish a run. I hope that was helpful. See you in the next one.